Could have kept singing, I thought. I'm going to talk in the water. But God is so good. Praise God. Ain't nobody like him. The song says you can search the whole world over. You'll never find anybody like Jesus. Oh, praise God. I, I probably need a cough drop today. And I probably would have prepared myself for that if I thought I was going to sing to you. I'm good. I'm good. Praise God. The Lord is good. We're so appreciative of you. Grateful for you. More than that, God is more satisfied than I am about you. Sometimes in this world, you may think ain't nobody in this world but you, but I promise you, Jesus is better than everybody else in the world. Praise God. In Joshua chapter 17, I know we have sung a whole lot, and y'all done sung out. I know, I know. Amen. I just, I just thank God we got a song to sing. I thank God that we can worship God and not just sing the words to the song, but try and feel the words you're singing and pick up on what you're singing. Praise God. And in Joshua chapter 17, verse 16, I just want to preach a little short while here and let you go. Praise God. It's so good when we start thinking heavenly and think about just staying all day. Oh, <laughs> oh I'm sorry. Some of y'all think eternity has time, and I bet you do, don't you? That song said, boy, if you've been there a thousand days, you have only just begun. Well, Eternity is if a bird was taking one grain of sand from the moon and would get it, the moon transferred down to earth. And by the time we got all the sand transferred down to earth, eternity still haven't started yet. In other words, we are timeless. We are time people. We are temporary settings. And so it's kind of hard sometimes for us to think outside of time. Matter of fact, I go crazy thinking about when, when, what was it before there was time? You know, what were they doing? Without 60 seconds and without a 60 minutes to let me know I was up, I messed up. But in Joshua, I said, and children of Joseph said, the hill is not enough for us. And all of the Canaanites that dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron both they who are of Bethshean and her towns and they who are of the valley of Jezreel. Basically, here you had the children of God camped out on some nice ground but small. And he says it's too small for us. But the option is, is that if I go down in the valley, there's more room. But the problem is, there's more room, but there's a lot more obstacles. So I want to I preach this morning about going down in the valley. Precious God, I love you and thank you so much for what you've already done in this place. Resting our spirits, dear God, and allowing us, dear God, to lock into you, you into us, and I appreciate your ministry in the house today. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you. In Jesus' name. You may be seated for just a moment. I promise you I'm not going to be eternal. I'm doing my best to respect your time. But I think it was, I know it was Apostle Paul that made a proclamation or a statement that said, when I was a child, I spake as a child. And so, but when I became grown, I put away childish things. You know, there's nothing more intriguing than the mind of a child. Sometimes wish I could go in and dissect and see exactly what they be thinking about. They could be looking off in the east somewhere and just go. What are you thinking about? They'll say nothing. You cannot be staring that hard and not be thinking nothing. But I know as a child, we have an amazing uh, imagination. 
And sometimes as a child, it don't take a lot to please us. See, I thought I'd really travel when I went around the block for my first time as a child. It was a real thrill to go to my neighbor's yard as a child because my boundaries were expanding. I always was wondering how old did I have to be before I could walk downtown by myself. I didn't even get an okay, but I snuck off the town by myself one time. And I was scared because I snuck and went to the show. And I was in the show. I expanded my boundaries. I had an okay, but see, I, as a child, growing out of childhood is expanding. The more you, older you get, you expand more. All of a sudden, you're going around the block. You know, usually when you're a little small child, mommy going to put you in the backyard and say, don't leave the yard. As you grow older, you say, mom, can I go down to the park and play? She says, yeah. And it won't be long before you be asking to go farther than you've ever went. So the Lord seems to specialize in, 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 in allowing people, allowing us to come to places of burnout. He knows how to bring his people to lessen the importance of things in your life. Like, you know, when I was a child, a young boy, my bicycle was the most important thing to me. But there came a day I got a car. I didn't even care about a bicycle. Even now, I got one in the garage that I don't even mess with now because you know what? I keep telling myself, you rode that when you was a child. I told my kids, they say, everybody's walking. Everybody's out in the park walking. I said, I know, but I did that when I was a kid too. I got all my walking in early. See, some of y'all, if you didn't walk, say, oh, we didn't have no cars in my day. I mean, yes, we did, but we couldn't afford them. So we walked. That's why I don't have to go to the park now. That didn't go well either. They say an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. But when I was a child, I had, had that somehow imaginary world. Any of y'all ever dream? Did you ever have a dream as a child? You know what I liked about my dreams? In my dreams, I am always, I am never the supporting cast. I am always the main character. Always. Man, I used to love playing cowboys. I always had the best looking stick. You know what I liked about it? I could shoot it all day and never reload. I would, I would get hit, get wounded. Oh, you shot me. I may get wounded, but I can't get killed. And I shake it all, be a hero. Oh, get all that and keep it. Ah, pow, pow, pow. And what I really loved about being a child and dreaming was not only I won every battle in my dream. I never, I ain't never got beat up in my dream. Never. I was some big dudes in my dream. It's always was bad in my dreams. See, and some people don't can't even have a good dream. They get whooped in their dreams. <laughs> they ain't even the main character in their dream. Somebody said, did you dream about me? No, you ain't the main character. I dreamed about me. If I let you in my dream, then you're supporting character. That's all you're doing. You're supporting role. I loved it when I got in my dreams and I, I win battles and, and I begin to realize I see a lot of people standing on the side. Some of y'all, y'all be standing on the side, waving and hollering at me, cheering for me. And I be coming down, having that ticker tape parade, waving at you, y'all throwing confetti on me and everything. Y'all calling my name, Kelly, Kelly, yay. And I'm just waving at y'all on the back of that big old limousine. Y'all don't have dreams like that? 
Man. Well, I must be vain in my dream, but when I have a dream, I enjoy my dream. I, I'm in it for the enjoyment, and I, I don't have bad dreams. If I do, I change my channel. Somebody say, how you do that? Just turn over. Maybe you had a bad connection sometimes in your dream. You're hooking up to the wrong thing. And you might need to change your position to get a new view of yourself. And so I just, if I'm having a bad dream sleeping on my stomach, I got to turn over. But I know that as a child we have this imagination. It's not uncommon. Even in a dream to, to conquer a hill and put your little flag on it and stand there, you know, you know, with your M16 or whatever, feeling all great and heroish. And then think in your mind that you have conquered a mountain. It's only just a hill. And a lot of things, even as we get grown, we still have imagination. And sometimes we're still trying to get on a hill and not get on a mountain. Sometimes we understand what a hill is. Sometimes most hills are man-made. Some of them are nature-made, but most of the hills are just miniature mountains. They're not real mountains. They're not big mountains. They're just hills. And we read this morning where the children of Israel, the children of Joseph, were sitting on top of a hill called Gilboa. And they came to the conclusion that where they were was not big enough. You know, the strangest thing is that, you know, this world is so big, we ain't even got to be crowded. I have drove, I have rid, ridden down, uh, went down country roads. I went down highways where ain't no houses, nowhere for uh, miles and miles. And yet we're all bunched up inside of a city. Don't get me wrong, I ain't moving out now. But I hear them all the time talking about, boy, we're running out of space. No, we're not running. We're running out of places where people want to live together. But we got a whole lot of room and a whole lot of space is yet to be discovered, lived on, worked. And so our place sometimes, as they were, becomes small. And that's the reason why everybody gather in cities and pile themselves up in cities. That's the reason why. Because as, it's easier to live like that. Everything you need... I wouldn't want to be 50 miles out in the country and don't even have a, don't even have a Walmart. I don't want to be way out someplace where ain't no grocery store for the next two or 500 miles or so. I don't want to live there. I love the convenience of being able to step out my door any time of the night and go out to Walmart and they're still taking my money. I like to be able to go, if I get hungry, to go and get me a sandwich somewhere that's still open. Well, city life. What happened on that hill they was on called a hill of Gilboa, it was a hill of joy. It was a hill where joy bubbled and flowed. And you that you get people, if you can create enough bubbles of joy, everybody will congregate. Everybody try to get on that hill. Everybody trying to find their place on that hill. That's the reason why a lot of times is that when you get shouting and going on, get uh, having yourself a time, everybody want to get in on your hill. If they see that your pew is a hot pew, everybody wants to sit in that pew. Or they want to run from that pew. But in that place, it had become so small. It was not enough room for everybody to get all that bubbling joy. And what happened, their enemy had kind of forced them to stay in a level of joy. And the real uh, treasures they needed was in the valley. You can always tell, hear this, please. You can always tell when something is spiritually beneficial for you. You have to fight for it. You really have to fight for it. You can always tell when something is really for you. It won't come easy. You don't find gold on top of the hill. You got to dig for it. You can always tell what's really worth something by how much fight and resistance you get about it. 
See, the, you know, the enemy will never, ever stop you from slapping your brother. Matter of fact, he'll hold your hand and help you do it. But the hard part is when you can't. It's what you wonder, why can't I? Because the best part is that you don't. You're more like Christ when you don't smack it. Praise God. But the major thing is this. The enemy knows how to place resistance so that you will not get what you really need. He really don't care if we come in here today and we jump and shout and get our joy. He really don't care. Because he knows we're going to come back and try to find the same little hill next week and get our joy again and not really get what we need. And so he had parked these big old iron chariots down here in that valley because uh, what we really need, we ain't going to find on the top of the mountain. I mean, the Bible says, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Amen. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Then he says, Yea, though I walk through the valley. Uh-oh. You know, you know, in, in this walk with God, believe it, it ain't all mountains. Sometimes there are some valleys. And you need to realize that it's if David was trying to tell you, you know what? He is your shepherd. He will give you what you need, but you still got to go through the valley. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thy rod and thy staff, they come with me. So here's David trying to show us, or show me, that God prepares us before we ever go through the valley. He already prepared you. He had to go back to the, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. First, he'd give you rest. He'd give you, quench your thirst. he let you feast. Get your strength up. And then, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even in this valley, it seems to be inevitable that one day, someday, somehow, there is a valley that everybody walks through that may even seem like it kills your soul. The valley of distress, the valley of calamity, the valley of affliction, the valley of adversity, but there are valleys. Even the psalmist called the valley, he said it was the valley of Baca, which means it's a valley of tears. And so there is a valley, but there has to be something in the valley for God to want me and you to walk through to obtain. You know, every now and then, God will throw something in there, one place hid behind a lot of scriptures. I think it was in the Song of Solomon when he talked about being the lily. Some people say, I know God on the mountaintop. But you got to come down in the valley to know him as a lily. And the Bible says he is a lily of the valley. You know, in, 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 my, in, in studying about this lily, I found out some things about why. He is the lily of the valley. In searching out this lily that's talking about in the Bible, that grows over there in the Bible, they say that this lily has what they call some special kind of distilled water. Just like now I need some. Because my voice is getting rough. But they got distilled water that comes out of that lily in the valley. That if you drink it, it gives strength to your voice. It causes your voice to clear up. Give you a pure sound and a clear sound. Ain't nothing like being in the valley. You want to have a good voice. You know why? Because then down there you may have to call on him. 
It ain't nothing like being in the valley and you can't talk. Ain't nothing like being going through stuff and can't open up your mouth. Going through things where you can't say, Jesus. In the valley, the lily gives you water that comes from it that allows your voice to become quite clear. And that distilled water begin to clear up so you can call on the name of the Lord. For in the day that you call upon him, he will come. And that same, it got juices in it. They say that revitalizes you, that gives you strength, that somehow keeps you from fainting. If you feel like you can't make it, the lily of the valley has fluids in it that squeezed out. And when you begin to drink it, your whole body begins to get energized, like drinking two cups of uh, uh, espresso. Y'all ever drink that? I messed around one time, told him, give me one of them triple shots of that. I said, I'll run my car. I said, let it just go home by itself, and I'll run it. Man, i tell you what, I was spaced out. I mean, that's, that's some bad stuff. Espresso, get a triple dip. You want to stay up a while? You'll be up a while. But that juice from that lily gives you strength. People say, well, well, I'm down here in the valley. I don't think I can get out. Why don't you squeeze the lily a little bit? Huh? Why don't you take some of the juice out the lily a little bit and, and get some strength back so you can get out that valley? Because there's one thing about it. You, God don't take you to the valley to leave you there. He wants to take you through the valley. So he's not trying to leave you there. You get down in the valley, you get down in yourself and say, I can't get out. I, I want to get out. I can't get out the valley. It, it says that even this juice from the, the uh, lily will purify your liver and kidneys. Take care of all your vitals. says that it will cause your liver to get cleaned up. We know that's where the blood is. It cures dropsy, swelling when you got too much fluid in your body. And then there is an oil. Then there is an oil that comes from it, it squeezes from it, and they use it to put on you. It has a salve. They put it on, not only that, they say if you got heart problem, guess what this lily juice does? It helps your heart problem. Some of y'all heart may be feeling like faint. Some of you may be having a hard time with your heart right now. Well, you need the lily of the valley. So you wondered, you know, well, what about my attitude? You need some oil from the lily. It's been known that the oil of the lily also help attitude. It'll help you from having a heart attack. It is good for heart disease. And no wonder the devil don't want you to go through. It's because he knows if you get to the valley, you can find the lily of the valley in the valley. And so... That's even why in the book of Nehemiah, when they had to rebuild the city, they had to rebuild a wall. There was a gate in the valley that had been broken down. The Bible said there's a man by the name of Hanan, and his name meant compassion, mercy, and grace. And he went, he says, you know what I need to do? I got to repair this gate in the valley so that someone in the valley can understand compassion, mercy, and grace. Surely when David began to talk about thou prepared the table before me in the presence of my enemies, God have to let you have enemies so you'll know how to eat. If I got enemies, then God's the cook. When I get ready to get fed, he's going to feed me in front of them. He said, so here... He prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He's coming through the valley. He anointed my head. Oh, I got some lily juice on me now. I ain't just eating, but I got lily juice all on me. Run all down top of my head, lily juice. He prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemy. He anointed my head with oil, boy, when he saw that. You thought you had joy on top of that hill. 
You thought you was really doing something on top of the hill. He said, but then on the valley, he said, but my cup is just running over, overflowing. He said, my cup runneth over. And then he went on to say, because in the valley, remember Hanan's name was compassion. He said, and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Some of us right now, we may be faced with valleys. We may have valleys, and valleys are so fearful because of they're so far down. It takes us way down. But let me tell you about there is something in the valley because God didn't leave you in the valley by yourself. He wanted to make sure when you get in the valley, you will get out the valley, not because you're trying to get out, because he got something there for you. Don't ever leave, don't ever run from anything in this life. Because if God brings you to it, he will also bring you through it. I have to realize that in every valley, there's got to be something in the valley for me. If it wasn't, the devil wouldn't fight like that. He knows. I remember back when, the, when the, uh, these uh, Canaanites came against Israel again. Sisera had 600, 900 iron chariots. Had them in the valley trying to keep the children of Israel from taking the valley. But what he didn't understand is this. Yes, in the valley you may weep. Matter of fact, he called it, it was a valley of tears. God always knows your best weapon. That's why he said there's a time to laugh sometimes. Then there's a time to cry. They cried to the Lord and said, you know, God, we want to take the valley, but boy, they down up the big iron chairs. We can't do it. You know what God done? They started crying to God, and God started crying from heaven and sent rain. You know what happened to the iron chariots when the rain hit the ground? They couldn't move. They sunk down. It was too heavy. The weapon, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. You'll never have to worry about any weapon formed against you. It cannot prosper. So they began to cry. When they cried to God, God cried to earth. When they began to cry to God, God let down rain. And all of a sudden, they're crying to God. Rain come down. Iron chariots can't move. And now they have conquered the very valley they thought they couldn't conquer. You may have to cry. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. If for some reason God brought you to a place of tears, don't fight it. Every now and then, what we do in the natural has also been doing, done in the spirit. Sometimes when God wants to send rain, he has to bring rain. Oh, praise God. And sometimes we want to feel like, oh, God, uh, I don't want nobody to see me cry. That might be the very thing they need to see. Maybe they need to see you cry. So when the iron chairs are mired down in the dirt, they'll realize, boy, they cried on me. They done cried and messed up everything for me. Because God is sending and will send us through a valley. But don't get afraid of the valley because you're coming out. Ain't no valley can keep you. I can't stress enough how important it is to move in obedience. And I think even today, you know, I, I keep my eyes closed. I like to play, keep my eyes closed, but I felt a little rumbling every now and then. When you're sitting in the church, I'm telling you, don't, don't just sit here. If I'm here with a problem, you're sitting here with a problem, be trying to listen for God. Because in the midst of a service, sometimes in the midst of praise and worship, God sends a word. And it might be something just simple. Would you just lift your right hand to me? It may be something simple. Would you just get up and just turn around three times? It may be something as simple as that, and you will begin to move on that, and all of a sudden God begins to work because of your obedience. When God says, go, go. When he says, Go forward, go forward. If he says, stop, stop. But when God says, lift your hand, go ahead and lift your hand. I understand that you want, your, you, you want to have a good orderly church service, but we're out of that. I am interested in people getting healed. I am interested in people getting delivered. I'm interested in God coming in. And when I walk away saying, it was a good service, but didn't nobody get healed. It was a good service, but nobody got touched. 
No, that's not a good service. A good service is when somebody in this audience heard God, responded, done what God said, and God responded to what their obedience was and performed like God wants to perform. God wants to give us more than just a little heal, bubbling over with joy every now and then. We fighting for position. God says, I've got a whole wide possession, and all you have to do is to step out and step up into what I'm trying to give you. You don't realize just what you really have in God. Oh, hallelujah. Our greatest weapon is just an old-fashioned Holy Ghost outpouring. When everything else ain't working, nothing's going to beat Holy Ghost out, boy. Amen. Nothing's going to beat that. Sometimes, amen, they found out that when God, when God put them in the valley, they cried. God rained down on them. Sometimes God is trying to get us to a place that we can become broken enough. So that we can begin to pour out that we might get poured on. Oh, hallelujah. Lord calls you to triumph over all your enemies when you're willing to offer yourself. That's what they done. The Bible said, and there came a time in our text today when finally they came and said, we're going to willingly give ourselves. You know what? And I, I began to set and realize one thing about a willingness to give yourself to God. But it takes a lot of trust. I begin to realize a willingness to give yourself to God and what that really entails. And when I begin to study, realize one thing. When they willingly gave themselves to God, it's because they had already seen in their mind and believed in their heart that what they were asking for was already theirs. I'm getting ready to close. So I mean, I'm getting ready to close. Right? Yeah, I'm getting ready to close. When you know what is yours, when you really know that, now I know, let me ask this and I'm getting ready to close. Some of you want something from God, right? And some of you are saying, Lord, when you give that to me, I'm really going to shout, I'm really going to praise you. You know what happens when you willingly give yourself to God? You don't wait till you get it to do it. What happens is that you're going to shout just as hard before you get it as you do when you get it. Mm -mm. You know, see, because I, if, if I knew right now that I had $500 coming tomorrow? I hit one. But see, you know what we do? We hit that after. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of easy to shout after I get it, though, ain't it? Because you just don't, but when you willingly give yourself to God, you shout for what you are asking for as if you have already got it. And when we learn how to do that, you know, I think they had a song a long time ago. Don't wait till the battle's over. Because if I'm waiting for it, oh, I've got reservation in my mind, well, there may be ever victory. But when I let the devil know, I'm not going to wait till the battle's over. I'm not going to wait till everything subside. I'm going to be just as joyful and happy and grateful. I'm going to praise him now as if I already got it. Because that's all that matters. And some of us, we have got to give ourselves to him willfully. Whatever you've been praying for, whatever you've been wanting from God, and you've been trying to tell God, putting him on hold till you get it. Take God off a hold of it. How long? I'm going to ask this question. I'm getting ready to close. I am. If 
the Lord told you, Brother Evans, I, you look like I can preach to you. I like you. And the Lord spoke to you today and say, Brother Evans, I'm giving you a new fusion tomorrow. I want you to wait till tomorrow. I want to, I want to, how much would we be willing to do to get what we don't have but know we'll get it tomorrow? No, and I, I'm, don't get me wrong. I, I, don't, I don't want you, I don't want you, I'm not doing this to, to put you in any kind of bad position. I don't want you to run the aisles. I don't want you dancing on top of self. That's not what I'm asking you for yourself because a lot, I want this to get in your mind. A lot of times that we want to wait, we'll come in. And we have needs, we have more needs than a center people fall in arches. And we'll set there as though everything is good. They say, God, when you bless me, when you bless me now, I wonder what would happen if we'd go ahead and say, you know, God promised, and so I know he's going to do it. I ain't going to even wait till I get it. I'm going to start praising God like I already got it. And then, you know what? Then I know then I'm going to get it because he's going to see my faith. He know I believe him. He know I know he's going to do it. Amen. I know he's going to do it. Hey, you know what? I, I, I believe that God is looking for somebody that says, you know what, Lord? I, you know the desires of my heart. What did the Bible say? God will give you. When those desires match up with his, I promise you, you can't stop him. But he wants to give you the desires of your heart. But you're saying, God, when you do, I'm going to do this. God is saying, I don't want you to wait till you get me. I want you to praise me like I already gave it to you. I want you to go ahead and show me how much you appreciate me before you ever get it. And when we begin to live and walk and act and begin to praise God like that, we didn't come here praising God because we're trying to make him do something. We already know he done done it. Already done it. Yep, already done it. Somebody said, Brother Wilson, I don't know. Yes, you do know. It's time for us to know. It's time for you to proceed. It's time for you to see. It's time for you to say, you know what? God showed it to me. God said it's mine. I'm going to go to church and they're going to think I got a million dollars because I'm just so happy. I'm happy. I'm happy. And they're going to say, well, what what you get today? Oh, no. I'm, I'm just happy about Jesus. I, I got this coming. I know it sounds crazy. But in order to live in this kingdom, you got to get crazy. God is not going to work with your logic. It is a logical thing for you to wait till you get the prize and come in and want to testify about what God just gave you. But I, I wish to God we start testifying about stuff that we haven't yet to receive, but yet it's getting. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I think it's time for us to start speaking things before we even see it. You know, it's a good testimony to serve when you get it. I know it is. But what, what kind of testimony to serve are we going to have when we quit being afraid to proclaim what we know is ours now? Huh? You done told somebody. I, I, you, you can go tell somebody, you know what? God's going to do that. They're going to say, mm-hmm, yeah. And you just that all excited. And the next thing you know, now when he, he does it, they're going to be the first one to grab you. Oh, you said God. You said, whoa. They're happy with you. It's time. It's time. No, God ain't slack. But your faith is going to determine what you're going to receive. And when you start to believe in God, I don't care what it's for, whatever it's for, unsaved kids, and saved loved ones, or whatever it is. And you say, I'll be so happy when they get in church. Could I tell you a secret now? Why don't you get happy before they get in? Because if you get happy before they get here, They'll probably get here a lot soon. Uh oh. Come on, stand with me. I got to let you go. Pray. I, I was trying to get out decent. There is no doubt in my mind. None. No reservation in what I will say today. There is not an enemy that you have that's not his. Did you realize that? 
Your enemy is God's enemy. Now, how, how many of y'all could, in your mind right now, in your little imaginary world, what enemy do you know going to beat up your God? Hmm? Don't you ever hang your head down crying over something like that. Can't nobody whoop him. You know what? I want to praise him. I want to worship God before I ever see it happen. Every day, getting up, just thanking God. Ain't nothing happen but just thanking God. Man, I have many testimonies from people who have spent years coming to church. One of the mothers of the church, one of my mothers in the gospel. She had a husband. He was a big gambler. He gambled all the money away every week. And she was going to church, trying to do good. But every week, he'd get up and work, go to the gambling house, spend all his money. Finally, one day he came in and told her, he ain't coming back home. She went to church, and she just had her seven. And while she was praising God in church, she decided, the Lord told her, now go get it. She said she walked across the bridge that night in Peoria. <clears throat> told him, went to the gambling house, stood up right beside him where he was. He broke down, started crying, and walked out with Friend, what I'm trying to tell you right now, this stuff really works. But one thing you got to get is your mind made up. You got to get focused right now and realize one thing. No, quit trying to figure it out flesh. Quit trying to think about what kind of scheme you can put on to trick him. Don't trick him. Get a hold of him. Huh? Get a hold of him. If you get a hold of him, but. Brother Tetch, I done seen this thing work more than one time. Once you get focused on God, God will take care of your business. But if you get focused on your business, God can't take care of your business. But if you get your mind on him, say, Lord, I just want to love you. I just want to worship you. I just want to praise you. I want to give praise under your name right now. I want to thank you, dear God, for what you've already done. I praise you. I thank you, dear God, for what you're doing right now. While I'm here in this place, you, your, your word is going beyond this place. Your spirit is going from this place. Lord, I praise you today. I praise you today. I thank you, dear God. I worship you. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Friend, if you have any, any kind of even request, any kind of desire, would you please do me one favor before you leave here right now? Would you please put that thing in the way before you leave? Pay down on it. You say, what do you mean, Brother Wilson? I mean this here. Don't leave here without leaving a praise on the table. Don't, don't leave here without putting something down on it. Let God know. You, you may not stay long enough today to get it done, but I would put something down on what I want God to do right now. I want you, as we get ready to close it today, I want you to think about what I just told you. And as we begin to close this out this morning in prayer, I want you to begin to thank him in advance. He got a bushy on the rope of bushy. Oh, hallelujah! Okay, let's let's do it in advance. Come on. He got a rope of bushy on the rope. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus! He got a rope of bushy. Oh, I praise you, Lord. I love you. Oh, I praise the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Come on, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God will do what he said he would do. Stand